New Accelerator by H.G. Wells. Certainly, if ever a man found a guinea when he was looking for a pin, it is my good friend Professor Gibbon. He has really, without any touch of exaggeration in the phrase, found something to revolutionise human life. And that when he was simply seeking an all-round nervous stimulant to bring languid people up to the stresses of these pushful days. I have tasted the stuff now several times, and I cannot do better than describe the effect the thing had on me. Professor Gibbon, as many people know, is my neighbour in Folkestone. He occupies one of those pleasant little detached houses in the mixed style that makes the western end of the Upper Sandgate Road so interesting. He likes to talk to me about his work. He is one of those men who find a help and stimulus in talking, and so I've been able to follow the conception of the new accelerator right up from a very early stage. As everyone knows, or at least as all intelligent people know, the special department in which Gibbon has gained so great and deserved a reputation among physiologists is the action of drugs upon the nervous system. In the last few years, he has been particularly assiduous upon this question of nervous stimulants and already, before the discovery of the new accelerator, very successful with them. In cases of exhaustion, the preparation known as Gibbon's B syrup has, I suppose, saved more lives already than any lifeboat round the coast. But none of these little things begin to satisfy me yet, he told me nearly a year ago. Either they increase the central energy without affecting the nerves, or they simply increase the available energy by lowering the nervous conductivity. And all of them are unequal and local in their operation. One wakes up the heart and viscera and leaves the brain stupefied. One gets at the brain champagne fashion and does nothing good for the solar plexus. And what I want, and what, if it's an earthly possibility, I mean to have is a stimulant that stimulates all round, that wakes you up for a time from the crown of your head to the tip of your great toe, and makes you go two or even three to everybody else's one. That's the thing I'm after. It would tire a man, I said. Not a doubt of it. And you'd eat double or treble and all that. But just think what the thing would mean. The power to think twice as fast, move twice as quickly, do twice as much work in a given time as you could otherwise do. But is such a thing possible? I believe so. If it isn't, I've wasted my time for a year. These various preparations of the hypophosphites, for example, seem to show that something of the sort, even if it was only one and a half times as fast it would do, if you were a statesman in the corner, for example, time rushing up against you, something urgent to be done, eh? He could dose his private secretary, I said, and gain double time. And think if you, for example, wanted to finish a book. Usually, I said, I wish I'd never begun them. You see, said Gibbon, if I get it as an all-round thing, it will really do you no harm at all, except perhaps to an infinitesimal degree it brings you nearer old age. And you really think such a thing is possible, I said. As possible, said Gibbon, and glanced at something that went throbbing by the window, as a motor bus. As a matter of fact, he paused and smiled at me deeply. I think I know the stuff. Already I've got something coming. The nervous smile upon his face betrayed the gravity of his revelation. He rarely talked of his actual experimental work unless things were very near the end. And it may be, it may be, I shouldn't be surprised, it may even do the thing at a greater rate than twice. It will be rather a big thing, I hazarded. It will be, I think, rather a big thing. But I don't think he quite knew what a big thing it was to be for all that. I remember we had several talks about the stuff after that. The new accelerator, he called it, and his tone about it grew more confident on each occasion. We debated long and anxiously how the preparation might be turned to commercial account. It's a good thing, said Gibbon. I know I'm giving the world something, and I think it only reasonable we should expect the world to pay. 
The dignity of science is all very well, but I think somehow I must have the monopoly of the stuff for, say, ten years. I don't see why all the fun in life should go to the dealers in ham. My own interest in the coming drug certainly did not wane in the time. I have always had a queer little twist towards metaphysics in my mind. I have always been given to paradoxes about space and time, and it seemed to me that Gibbon was really preparing no less than the absolute acceleration of life. Suppose a man repeatedly dosed with such a preparation. He would live an active and record life indeed, but he would be adult at eleven, middle-aged at twenty-five, and by thirty well on the road to senile decay. The marvel of drugs has always been great to my mind. You can madden a man, calm a man, make him incredibly strong and alert, or a helpless log. Quicken this passion and allay that, all by means of drugs. And here was a new miracle to be added to this strange armoury of files the doctors use. It was the 7th or 8th of August when he told me the distillation that would decide his failure or success for a time was going forward as we talked. And it was on the 10th that he told me the thing was done, and the new accelerator a tangible reality in the world. I met him as I was going up the Sandgate Hill towards Folkestone. I think I was going to get my hair cut. And he came hurrying down to meet me. I remember that his eyes were unusually bright, and his face flushed, and I noted even then the swift alacrity of his step. "'It's done!' he cried, speaking very fast. "'Come up to my house and see!' Really? And it does twice? It does much more, much more. Oh, it scares me. Come up and see the stuff. He gripped my arm, and walking at such a pace that he forced me into a trot, went shouting with me up the hill. It was one of those hot, clear days that Folkestone sees so much of, every colour incredibly bright and every outline hard. There was a breeze, of course, but not so much breeze as sufficed under these conditions to keep me cool and dry. "'You've been taking some of this stuff,' I puffed. "'No,' he said. "'At the utmost, a drop of water that stood in a beaker "'from which I had washed out the last traces of the stuff. "'I took some last night, you know, but that is ancient history now.' "'And it goes twice,' I said, nearing his doorway in a grateful perspiration. "'It goes a thousand times. Many thousand times,' cried Gibbon, flinging open his gate. "'Shh,' I said, and followed him to the door. I don't know how many times it goes, he said, with his latchkey in his hand. It throws all sorts of light on nervous physiology. It kicks the theory of vision into a perfectly new shape. Oh, we'll try all that after. The thing is, to try the stuff now. Try the stuff, I said, as we went along the passage. Rather, said Gibbon, turning on me in his study. There it is, in that little green file. Unless you happen to be afraid... I'm a careful man by nature, and only theoretically adventurous. I was afraid. But, on the other hand, there is pride. Well, I haggled, you say you've tried it? I've tried it, he said, and I don't look hurt by it, do I? I sat down. Give me the potion, I said. If the worst comes to the worst, it will save having my hair cut, and I think that is one of the most hateful duties of a civilised man. How do you take the mixture? "'With water,' said Gibbon, whacking down a carafe. "'He stood up in front of his desk and regarded me in his easy chair. "'His manner was suddenly affected by a touch of the Harley Street specialist. "'I must warn you, in the first place, as soon as you've got it down, "'to shut your eyes and open them very cautiously in a minute or so's time. "'One still sees. "'The sense of vision is a question of length of vibration and not of multitude of impacts, but there is a kind of shock to the retina, a nasty, giddy confusion just at the time if the eyes are open. Keep them shut. Shut, I said. Good. And the next thing is, keep still. Don't begin to whack about. You may fetch something a nasty rap if you do. Remember, you will be going several thousand times faster than you ever did before. You'll feel just as you do now, only everything in the world will seem to be going ever so many thousand times slower than it ever went before. Law, I said. And you mean... You'll see, he said, and he took up a little measure. The little file glucked out its precious contents. Don't forget what I told you, 
he said, turning the contents of the measure into a glass in the manner of an Italian waiter measuring whisky. Sit with the eyes tightly shut and in absolute stillness for two minutes. Then you will hear me speak. He added an inch or so of water to the dose in each glass. He raised his glass. The new accelerator, I said. The new accelerator, he answered, and we touched glasses and drank. You know that blank non-existence into which one drops when one has taken gas? For an indefinite interval, it was like that. Then I heard Gibbon telling me to wake up, and I stirred and opened my eyes. There he stood, as he had been standing, glass still in hand. It was empty. That was all the difference. Well, said I, nothing out of the way? Nothing. A, a slight feeling of exhilaration, perhaps? Nothing more? Sounds? Things are still, I said. Oh, by Jove, yes, <laughs> they are still, except that sort of faint pat-patter like rain falling. Oh, what is it? Analyzed sounds, I think he said, but I'm not sure. He glanced at the window. Have you ever seen a curtain before a window fixed in that way before? I followed his eyes, and there was the end of the curtain, frozen, as it were, corner high, in the act of flapping briskly in the breeze. No, I said. That's odd. And here, he said, and opened the hand that held the glass. Naturally, I winced, expecting the glass to smash. But so far from smashing, it did not even seem to stir. It hung in mid-air, motionless. Roughly speaking, said Gibbon, an object in these latitudes falls sixteen feet in the first second. This glass is falling sixteen feet in a second now. Only, you see, it hasn't been falling yet for the hundredth part of a second. That gives you some idea of the pace of my accelerator. And he waved his hand round and round, over and under the slowly sinking glass. Finally, he took it by the bottom, pulled it down, and placed it very carefully on the table. I began very gingerly to raise myself from my chair. I was going fast all over. My heart, for example, was beating a thousand times a second, but that caused me no discomfort at all. I looked out of the window. An immovable cyclist, head down, and with a frozen puff of dust behind his driving wheel, scorched to overtake a galloping charabang that did not stir. I gaped in amazement. Gibbon! I cried. How long will this confounded stuff last? Heaven knows, he answered. Last time I took it, I went to bed and slept it off. It must have lasted some minutes, I think. Seemed like hours. But after a bit, it slows down rather suddenly, I believe. I was proud to observe that I did not feel frightened. I suppose because there were two of us. Why shouldn't we go out? I asked. Why not? They'll see us. Not they. Goodness, no. Why, we shall be going a thousand times faster than the quickest conjuring trick that was ever done. Come along. Assuredly, of all the strange experiences that I've ever had, or imagined, or read of other people having or imagining, that little raid I made with Gibbon on the Folkestone Lees, under the influence of the new accelerator, was the strangest and maddest of all. We went out by his gate into the road, and there we made a minute examination of the statuesque passing traffic. The tops of the wheels and some of the legs of the horses of this charabang, the end of the whiplash and the lower jaw of the conductor, who was just beginning to yawn, were perceptibly in motion, but all the rest of the lumbering conveyance seemed still and quite noiseless except for a faint rattling that came from one man's throat. The effect, as we walked about, began by being madly queer and ended by being disagreeable. There they were, people like ourselves and yet not like ourselves, frozen in careless attitudes, caught in mid-gesture. A girl and a man smiled at one another, a leering smile that threatened to last for evermore. 
A woman in a floppy capeline rested her arm on the rail and stared at Gibbon's house with the unwinking stare of eternity. A man stroked his moustache like a figure of wax. We stared at them, we laughed at them, we made faces at them, and then a sort of disgust of them came upon us, and we turned away and walked round in front of the cyclist towards the Lees. Goodness, cried Gibbon suddenly, look there! He pointed, and there at the tip of his finger, and sliding down the air with wings flapping slowly and at the speed of an exceptionally languid snail, was a bee. And so we came out upon the Lees. There the thing seemed madder than ever. The band was playing in the upper stand, though all the sound it made for us was a low-pitched, wheezy rattle, a sort of prolonged last sigh that passed at times into a sound like the slow, muffled ticking of some monstrous clock. "'Lord, look here!' cried Gibbon, and we halted for a moment before a magnificent person in white faint-striped flannels, white shoes and a Panama hat, who turned back to wink at two gaily-dressed ladies he'd passed. A wink, studied with such leisurely deliberation as we could afford, is an unattractive thing. It loses any quality of alert gaiety. And one remarks that the winking eye does not completely close, that under its drooping lid appears the lower edge of an eyeball and a little line of white. Heaven give me memory, said I, and I will never wink again. Or smile, said Gibbon, with his eye on the lady's answering teeth. It's infernally hot somehow, said I. Let's go slower. Oh, come along, said Gibbon. We walked a little way from the crowd and turned and regarded it. To see all that multitude changed to a picture, smitten rigid, as it were, into the semblance of realistic wax, was impossibly wonderful. It was absurd, of course, but it filled me with an irrational, an exultant sense of superior advantage. Consider the wonder of it. All that I had said and thought and done since the stuff had begun to work in my veins had happened, so far as those people, so far as the world in general went, in the twinkling of an eye. The new accelerator, I began, but Gibbon interrupted me. There's that infernal old woman, he said. What old woman? Lives next door to me, said Gibbon. Has a lapdog that yaps. God, the temptation is strong. There is something very boyish and impulsive about Gibbon at times. Before I could expostulate with him, he had dashed forward, snatched the unfortunate animal out of visible existence, and was running violently with it towards the cliff of the Lees. It was most extraordinary. The little brute, you know, didn't bark or wriggle or make the slightest sign of vitality. It kept quite stiffly in an attitude of somnolent repose, and Gibbon held it by the neck. It was like running about with a dog of wood. Gibbon, I cried, put it down. Then I said something else. If you run like that, I cried, you'll set your clothes on fire. He clapped his hand on his thigh and stood hesitating on the verge. Gibbon, I cried, coming up, put it down. This heat is too much. Two or three miles a second. Friction of the air. What? he said, glancing at the dog. Friction of the air, I shouted. Going too fast, like meteorites and things. Too hot. And Gibbon, Gibbon, I... I'm all over pricking and a sort of perspiration. You can see people stirring slightly. I believe the stuff's working off. Put that dog down. Eh? he said. It's working off, I repeated. We're too hot and the stuff's working off. He stared at me, then at the band, the wheezy rattle of whose performance was certainly going faster. Then, with a tremendous sweep of the arm, he hurled the dog away from him, and it went spinning upward, still inanimate, and hung at last over the grouped parasols of a knot of chattering people. Gibbon was gripping my elbow. By Jove, he cried, I believe it is a sort of hot pricking, and, yes, that man's moving his pocket handkerchief, perceptibly. We must get out of this, sharp. But we could not get out of it sharply enough. Luckily, perhaps, for we might have run, and if we had run, we should, I believe, have burst into flames. You know, we had neither of us thought of that. But before we could even begin to run, the action of the drug had ceased. 
It was the business of a minute fraction of a second. The effect of the new accelerator passed like the drawing of a curtain, vanished in the movement of a hand. I heard Gibbon's voice in infinite alarm. Sit down, he said, and flop. Down upon the turf at the edge of the lees I sat, scorching as I sat. There was a patch of burnt grass there still where I sat down. The whole stagnation seemed to wake up as I did so. The disarticulated vibration of the band rushed together into a blast of music. The promenaders put their feet down and walked their ways. The papers and flags began flapping. Smiles passed into words. The winker finished his wink and went on his way complacently. The little dog, which had seemed to hang for a moment when the force of Gibbon's arm was expended, fell with a swift acceleration clean through a lady's parasol. That was the saving of us. I doubt if a solitary person remarked our sudden appearance among them. The attention of everyone, including even the Amusements Association band, which, on this occasion, for the only time in its history, got out of tune, was arrested by the amazing fact that a respectable, overfed lapdog, sleeping quietly to the east of the bandstand, should suddenly fall through the parasol of a lady on the west. People got up and trod on other people. Chairs were overturned. The Lee's policeman ran. How the matter settled itself, I do not know. We were much too anxious to disentangle ourselves from the affair. As soon as we were sufficiently cool and sufficiently recovered from our giddiness and nausea and confusion of mind to do so, we stood up and, skirting the crowd, directed our steps back along the road below the Metropole towards Gibbon's house. The sudden return of movement and familiar noises and our natural anxiety about ourselves, our clothes were still dreadfully hot and the front of the thighs of Gibbon's white trousers were scorched a drabbish brown, prevented the minute observations I should have liked to make on all these things. Indeed, I really made no observations of any scientific value on that return. The bee, of course, had gone. I looked for that cyclist, but he was already out of sight as we came into the upper Sandgate Road, or hidden from us by traffic. The Sharabang, however, with its people now all alive and stirring, was clattering along at a spanking pace almost abreast of the nearer church. So it was I had my first experience of the new accelerator. Practically, we had been running about and saying and doing all sorts of things in the space of a second or so of time. Considering all things, and particularly considering our rashness in venturing out of the house, the experience might certainly have been much more disagreeable than it was. It showed, no doubt, that Gibbon still has much to learn before his preparation is a manageable convenience, but its practicability is certainly demonstrated beyond all cavil. Since that adventure he has been steadily bringing its use under control, and I have several times, and without the slightest bad result, taken measured doses under his direction. I may mention, for example, that this story has been written at one sitting, and without interruption, except for the nibbling of some chocolate, by its means. I began at 6.25, and my watch is now very nearly at the minute past the half-hour. The convenience of securing a long, uninterrupted spell of work in the midst of a day full of engagements cannot be exaggerated. Gibbon is now working at the quantitative handling of his preparation, with a special reference to its distinctive effects upon different types of constitution. He then hopes to find a retarder with which to dilute its present rather excessive potency. The retarder will, of course, have the reverse effect of the accelerator. Used alone, it should enable the patient to spread a few seconds over many hours of ordinary time, and so to maintain a glacier-like absence of alacrity amidst the most animated or irritating surroundings. The two things together must necessarily work an entire revolution in civilized existence. It is the beginning of our escape from that time garment of which Carlyle speaks. The accelerator's appearance upon the market in a convenient, controllable and assimilable form is a matter of the next few months. It will be obtainable of all chemists and druggists in small green bottles at a high, but considering its extraordinary qualities, by no means excessive price. 
Gibbon's Nervous Accelerator, it will be called, and he hopes to be able to supply it in three strengths, one in 200, one in 900, and one in 2,000. No doubt its use renders a great number of very extraordinary things possible. For, of course, the most remarkable and possibly even criminal proceedings may be affected with impunity by thus dodging, as it were, into the interstices of time. Like all potent preparations, it will be liable to abuse. We have, however, discussed this aspect of the question very thoroughly, and we have decided that it is purely a matter of medical jurisprudence, and altogether outside our province. We shall manufacture and sell the accelerator, and, as for the consequences, we shall see. <laughs>